Yeah. Why not so a couple of gold sort of slash or brackets uranium deposits in South, Southern Australia, how to form one and how to find one. But that's a crazy title. Of course, you know, um, how to find one is the, is obviously really, you know, it is very, <laughs> it's difficult, okay? And of course, out in South Australia, it's entirely buried, okay? So the drill court photo there is to remind me to tell you that in this part of the world, um, you basically, you've just got sand dunes, you've got, um, a, you've got um, Cretaceous Aramanga Basin, you've got uh, Neoproterozoic sandstones of the Adelaide Super Basin, part of the Centralian Super Basin, and below that you also have Mesoproterozoic um, rocks of what's called another, there's another basin on top of that. So there's at least four sedimentary rock systems sitting not necessarily in every spot, but there are a lot of basins sitting on top of that. And of course, you know, that's that's intercontinental tectonics for you and the Northern Territory doesn't is not immune to that, even though you have more outcrop <laughs> than um, Southern Australia. So the Olympic Dam deposit is um, the fourth largest copper resource, third largest gold resource, and the largest uranium deposit in the world. So it's a big deal. This, this is a huge deposit. Um, you know, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a nation building it's an important type of deposit for the country, right? So um, it's it's really worthwhile reflecting on how big this thing is. It's it's stupendously large. And the downside of that is there's only one downside, and that is that everybody, when they think of South Australia, they only think of Olympic Dam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Geologically speaking, <laughs> uh, you know, they think of uh, the Olympic Dam deposit. So what it means is every other deposit looks small in comparison to Olympic Dam, but that's just because it's a super giant deposit. So there are plenty of good sized deposits in of this style in the Gore Pattern as well, which will form good mines and, and are good deposits, but Olympic Dam just dwarfs everything. And forget about any other mineral system or mineral deposit type in, in South Australia as well, because people just don't, it's just not what they think of. So we've, we and I spent a lot of time in the geological survey trying to get people to think about different mineral systems. But here, I'm not going to talk about different mineral systems. I want to talk about this particular one because I think that is, you know, something of interest to people in the territory is what's going on at that time. Um, what are the what are the factors involved in this deposit and, and the system around it? So it's, this deposit is located in what's called the Olympic Copper Gold Province in the eastern core crater. So if you look up the Olympic Copper Gold Province, you get a series of papers which are about um, about that province. It's mesoproterozoic, about 1.6 billion years old. Um, this deposit is one example of a hematite rich deposit, uh, but I want to emphasize that you can have magnetite or hematite rich styles deposit in this IOCG kind of family. Um, the classic IOCG is the hematite breaches because they were sort of first described at Olympic Dam. Um, some of the first papers on this style of deposit were, were at Olympic Dam when they kind of recognize them as unique classes. Um, but it's really a metasomatic iron oxide, alkali, calcic alteration system that these things formed in. And that's the key sort of piece of information, uh, which you can see. Is that right? No, I was going to say just press the X yeah, on yeah, that yeah, thing yeah, and we can Yeah, done. <laughs> uh, and you can see that. So the, the point is, it's a, it's a continuum of process, and we should never be surprised to find variants on a theme. Okay. So this is sort of little diagram just shows you from source to proximal to distal. So source means source of the hydrothermal fluids through to distal kind of um, depositional sites, right? So source means it's more higher temperature. You have magnetite rich rocks. It's this sort of scarn site system. Karuna type is sort of a little bit kind of slightly more distal because you have other uh, minerals. Instead of garnet and peroxines, you have apatites and, and um, uh, amphiboles, which uh, so they have a slightly different mineralogy. Uh, but Olympic Dam then goes from either a magnetite or hematite matrix, and it's a breccia style system that's already telling you it's in the, in the upper crust because it's been fractured uh, hydraulically. Uh, Olympic Dam, it's obviously hematite, but you can get magnetite breccia as well. And these deposit types are most, the ones which have the most copper and gold. Of course, the other ones do have that as well. But then you get sort of concurry type, which is actually pretty good, put Tennant Creek kind of into that basket. And in fact, the stuff, the deposits in the Kunamona province are pretty. Are probably related to that as well. And they're more like veins, dissemination, replacement style deposits. Um, you know, and that's getting as the fluid pulse or fluid is moving or fluids are moving through the rock mass, you get more and more distal, and that's what you're in kind of ending up with. 
They're always related to A to I type magnetism. Um, I type and A type just suggest that we have a cross mantle source. So the mantle source differentiation and so on to produce these more A type rocks. Um, back art tectonic setting. I mean, that's, you know, in, uh, people who work in Proterozoic Australia will, you know, will know why my, why my head is bowed and shaking at this point in time because it's very difficult to tell tectonic setting back in the, in the Proterozoic, uh, especially in Australia. Um, maybe in Canada they can have a better, better um, uh, feel for these things, but certainly in Australia it can be quite difficult to, to know where's an arc and where's not an arc. And some people put arcs where there probably isn't arcs and so on and so forth. Anyway, it's basically intercontinental and that's what back arc this means in this case. So uh, the fluids are higher to medium temperature and they're really salty usually and, and importantly a mixed source. And the more mixing of fluid you can get, the, the more scavenging of copper and, and gold from the source regions, but also those ligands sort of um, concentration increase so it can carry more um, in, 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 in solution. Uh, Roger Skiro has a map here, uh, which is just the seismic velocity map. So just all this shows is where basically Archean cratons or the kind of Paleoproterozoic Archean cratons are the blue areas. And it's just showing you that most of the deposits of this style, the IOCG ones, which are in the yellow boxes are in the blue zones most of them. Um, the Probably the Chilean and Peruvian deposits are a little bit different because they kind of, well, they're in subduction zone setting because you can bloody see the subduction zone. <laughs> uh, so that does, you know, that is, <laughs> there is a bit of debate about whether uh, the Peruvian and Chilean with the Andean style systems are, you know, this is where that whole, the, the, the people who make their career on cutting and dividing Deposit styles will go to town on the differences between these style of rocks versus, say, the, the protozoic ones we have here in Australia. But point is, they're they're they're, they're located around around the uh, around the globe, and um, yeah, some key ones are the, the Great Bear, which is uh, up in the Northwest Territories in Canada, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but uh, there's also the Karuna type up in the Scandinavia. There are some apparently in in India in, in, in around um, Rajasthan somewhere, but I don't know anything about them. And I would, I would be surprised <coughs> if there's not more in Africa, um, which maybe haven't been discovered or described, but they're, they're not there so far. All right, so listen, I'm, I'm pretty, I like to keep things pretty simple. So I love this diagram by John Ronsky et al um, from their paper where they describe what are the factors that go into forming a world-class ore deposit. Um, it's really useful to have only three things to think about rather than many. <clears throat> and they are having a fertile upper mantle with this folk scale structures and transient remobilization event. This is like the big picture. This is the first order of factors involved. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these three uh, in succession. This is, a, this is the section on how to form one, and then we'll get to the section on how to find one. Upper mantle. Okay, so... How do we know the composition of upper mantle? Geochemistry of major rocks tells you about the composition of upper mantle. Now, Claire Wade and the Geological Survey has done a huge amount of work on the major rocks, um, and in, 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 including the mineral rocks which formed broadly at the same time as the mineralization in the Eastern Gaul Craton. And she has produced this plot here, which has this is what we call the Gaul Range Volcanics. All the basaltic rocks in the Gaul Range Volcanics, these would all be well, there'd be less, 50% or less silica values, I'd imagine. Um, and, but basically the thorium niobium versus titanium ytterbium plot shows you that all of these, all these colored, you know, these colored um, squares and triangles, that's the, these are the Gaul range volcanic samples that all plot a plot in what is called subduction modified lithosphere field, right? So they have way more thorium than they should have if they're coming straight out of the depleted mantle, where the morb comes from, the mid ocean rich basalt style or even the oib. Um, there's a couple of those triangles actually plot down in the oib, um, and they're not from the region that has the iron oxide copper gold deposits. They're actually from a different region. I just wanted to note that because I'll show you in the next couple of slides, um, but there's a spatial variation. Another geochemical discrimination diagram, thorium, ytterbium versus niobium. So basically thorium um, and niobium are the discriminators here. And these, again, shows you that in terms of um, the relationship to sort of typical depleted mantle, these are metasomatized. 
they've much higher thorium than they should have, so to speak, if they were just coming out straight at the grid mantle. So this is a modified mantle um, that's sitting underneath the gold cradle. Now, before I go on, of course, some people might say to you, Anthony, you haven't shown me that these are juvenile enough rocks to say that they're not crustally contaminated. I know Joe was thinking that, I could just see, but I'm just saying that discrimination process has happened and Claire's got to that point here. <laughs> if you really want to know if these is there, okay. Talk to Claire. Talk to Claire, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, of course, there's some crust of contamination. I'm not, I'm not denying that, um, but these are the most juvenile things, or the most, uh, the most juvenile, um, uh, all the other trace elements juvenile, and this is showing you the, the thorium composition. Um, okay, so um, this, is the, this is a map now of the composition of epsilon near the indium value. Uh, of, of mafic rocks, the same set of mafic rocks or, or similar set of mafic rocks across the gold cradle. The star, sorry, the outline, I mean, I'm just so familiar with this, I forget, right? Adelaide is down here, I should even say to you, to you know, in territory people, and probably people with, who have no idea where this is. This is broadly South Australia, the border, right, is up there. So Alice Springs, you, you people in Alice Springs are sitting up here where the cursor is, and this is, the Stuart Highway goes straight down through here before we go to Adelaide, and I've just driven that, and I'll be driving it starting tomorrow to go back south. Olympic Dam sits in, in where this red star is, and these are the dot points here, which are the geochemical samples of these volcanics, which the volcanics formed at the same time as a deposit broadly. <coughs> what Claire's done here is contour them for their epsilon near dimming value. So red is juvenile-ish, but not super juvenile, but it's juvenile compared to the blue, which is more enriched, okay? So the point of this is actually to say that there's spatial variation in the composition of the depleted mantle. Oh, sorry, of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle within the Gaula Praton. So there are different zones that are being sampled um, at this time, some of which uh, have actually quite an evolved isotopic um, signature. Uh, another way to look at the um, composition of the mantle is with magnetotellurics, because magnetotellurics tells you about the um, conductivity. Um, this is a slice through a 3D model of the Southern Australian uh, magnetotelluric um, data. Again, this is Adelaide, I should show you again, Adelaide is down here, Olympic Dam just sits underneath this line here, and this is the Great Australian Bite through here, Air Peninsula, York Peninsula and so on. So this is broadly the Gaul Craton sits in this kind of blue zone, except right underneath this area, at, at quite, a, quite, a, you know, quite deep within the Lisbeth mantle, there is a zone of anomalous conductivity. So it, it's compositionally different from, say, the zone to the west of it, where um, <coughs> it's really quite resistive, which is resistive is a typical Archean craton, should look like that. So the craton should look like that, but here, close to these deposits, but not. Well, I'm not saying they're one to one contexts, but underneath that zone, uh, you can see this really um, more conductive zone. And this is a cross section through there, roughly where that line is. And again, you see this conductivity zone beneath the very resistive, typical Archean craton. Um, and this is where Olympic Dam sits here. So we know that the lithospheric mantle underneath the Gaula craton is conductive, and we know that it's geochemically metasomatized from that basaltic information. Okay, so we think that that we have a, a, a fertile mantle. So the fertile upper mantle. So we think we've got, we can nail this one first, right? I'll now talk a little bit about the structure. Because one thing to have a fertile upper mantle, but there's no way to take that material and put it in the upper crust and it's, it's useless to us, all right? So we need to look at, is there structure out there? Okay, so the first thing to look at the structure is we're gonna go back to the meeting of the lyrics instead of looking at 150 kilometers, so we can look at 35 kilometers. Basically the, uh, somewhere near the Moho, the, the crust mantle boundary, roughly. Um, again, you can see that blue zone there is the Archean core, right? So that's what the typical resistive core, although compared to the previous one, you now see that um, that conductivity zone has actually shifted northeast. So now there was a big zone at 150 kilometres about here, and at 35 kilometres it shifted over this way. And it's really interesting because now you start to see that these, these green dots are the other IOCG deposits and prospects. And they all sit more or less kind of in a, in a little bit of a belt in some spatial proximity too. And listen, I'm not saying again, it's not one-to-one, -one, 
but there is spatial proximity to a zone of elevated conductivity in the lower in the lower crust. Um, what that suggests is, is there's again in the same way that there's compositional contrast informing that basaltic composition, there's compositional contrast here informing the um, the, the composition of the uh, lower crust as well. And if you if we took that model and sliced it up further and further, you'll see that conductivity um, snakes its way up. And you can see that in the cross section here, um, where you, what we're looking at is this material through here. So there is conductivity here, which is basically on the edge of this structure, uh, where there isn't out in the main part of the ground. So that's evidence for a boundary of some description. It's a compositional boundary. It's not like we're mapping a fault, like you might go out in the field and see two rock types just, you know, offset and you say there's a fault. Um, we're showing broad zones of different geophysical character, which is, I mean, that's what, it, what are you expect in the, in the lower crust, right? Here's the classic uh, Olympic Dam seismic line. So this is just, just focus on this diagram from the top right here, um, just shows you this line going all the way through Olympic Dam and out the other side. Um, this was shot, I think, in 2003. So it's, all, it's getting reasonably old there. <clears throat> um, but you, you know, you've got an upper crust which has got a little bit of white stuff. This is this stuff up here is the Adelaide Rift Complex. So that's the near Proterozoic successions. But the key point here is that underneath this area, underneath the Olympic Dam, there is destruction of the or modification of the texture in that um, seismic section. Um, that's shown probably a lot better in the lower panel, which shows the, um, um, uh, thank you, the interpretation and the structures which people saw when they when they rolled that out and do it like pencils on the, on the <laughs> Anyway, so there's a bland zone underneath the Olympic Dam. So um, this is sort of another indicator that there is some feature under there and that corresponds to the, the magnetic, uh, sorry, magnetotelluric zone. There is blandness in the in the um, seismics as well. So all of that is suggesting that there is some modification that's happened in that region and it's right underneath the deposit. Of course, you can't cite a drill hole on the basis of that, but it's there anyway, right? So this shows a compilation of those from um, Hayward's Bureau just showing you the different features. So the, the dark line is... I forgot to say the moho is offset as well. So in this one, you can see on the south, the moho is higher than the north. So that's a good indication that there's a structure there because the moho itself is offset, right? Um, and the, the dark line is just showing you the outline of the broadly um, destructive uh, destruction of seismic texture. The red dashed line or the orange dashed line is showing you where that magnetotelluric um, sort of zone goes. And then what they also did was do, I think this unconstrained inversion on the gravity um, data across here as well to show shells of where uh, hematite is or could be and also on the magnetic data and that shows you these sort of magnetite hematite blobs here as well anyway it's showing that that magnetite probably extends quite a long way into the crust uh, and it's associated with high conductivity destruction of texture there's got to be something on top of this feature so if we find something like that in the, in the northern territory take it out a goddamn 10 minute because that <laughs> is going to have a deposit on top of it all right so here's the kind of um conceptual model from claire's work uh imagine some sort of mantle plume or mantle upwelling um it's interacting with a metasomatized sclm subcontinental lithospheric mantle um, those little blue scratchy chickens feet they're kind of meant to be um siderophile or chalcophile rich zones or veins in the lithospheric mantle and if some of this melt zone can encapsulate some of that metasomatic material, then it can be transported up into the upper crust. Okay, so this is kind of the standard. Um, in fact, this probably this diagram was actually drawn in the 1980s when they originally thought about this. They, you know, I don't think we've really done a lot. We've gone a full circle basically because originally they said it was a plume and, you know, so on. And then, of course, people like Pete Betts and <laughs> et cetera decided there were subduction zones and then, you know, basically Claire's work says, well, you could have a subduction zone, but it's not here. And that's about all you can say. So you need some lucas for that willing. Okay. So now I just need to talk a little bit about the transient remobilization events. So what uh, so I what I've established now is that the, the mantle is metasomatized, it's modified, it's going to have goodies in it. We can see there's a structure at the top, but we need a way of actually pumping that good, those goodies into the middle and upper crust. And that's this remobilization event. And that is the effect of this large igneous province, okay? So it happened at about 
Um, so felsic dominated, you can see on the right, on the left there, the Gawler Range Volcanics, huge, beautiful um, um, uh, lava sheets, which you can, this is probably the, these are the best exposed rocks in the entire Gawler Great on the, the Gawler Range. It's absolutely spectacular, these. You can see big flows of the stuff. Um, they're a basaltic, you can see the lower Gawler Range Volcanics has basaltic, um, um, like, what do they call them? complexes or you can see sheets and flows of basalt and then up of GOV, Kulaj Volcanics is dominated by these huge voluminous um, dacitic to um, you know, day sites basically, um, lava floods. So then, and, and then associated with them are the broadly um, coeval Hilda sweet granites on the right there. Um, there's Rapakibi textures. Um, there are a whole range of, there's a whole range of compositions and chemistries, obviously, basically dominated, but there's a distributed matrix of as well. Um, it's a big system. There's a lot of heat being pumped into the, these rocks. There's a lot of crustal melting, but there's a hell of a lot of mantle melting going on at the same time. And I'll just note that the there are similar age rocks happening in, in the um, Kunamona province at the time as well. That's this Banadri volcanic suite as well as the Nunnery suite. So, but we're concentrating there on the crawl as well. So these are the heat source and probably a metal source as well. When, when these A-type magmas are cooling and crystallizing, one of the last things that come off are these fluids and they can be rich in copper and or gold as well. So a lot of heat, a lot of heat. Um, this map shows you, the, you know, some of the key features of the Gawler Craft on Olympic Dam sits here, Adelaide is down here. All I want, just don't worry about it, except for the red blobs. If you just focus on the red, they're the Hiltipus sweet granites. They're all the ones which form at the same time, including at Olympic Dam. And then the other feature to note is the this sort of light purple zone here, which are the volcanics. So there's this huge volcanic edifice, and around the edges, like pearls around the on a necklace, is the uh, are the granites intrusive. So if we stripped off the volcanics, you'd probably find heaps of granites underneath there as well, right? But around the edges where there's been a little bit more uplift. Um, and erosion, you can find these, you know, you can find these granite sweats. So the, the total spatial extent of this large igneous province is, I think, we calculated like 100,000 square kilometres. So it's a huge thing. It's not a, it's not the Deccan Trap style large igneous province, but it's big, okay? It's big enough. Um, yep. And the, yeah, yeah. And in terms of their composition, uh, the Olympic, Domain granites are mostly A types. So they have um, these sort of A type composition, but you also get these I, and they're also S type granites there occasionally uh, in some areas. And that's not surprising at all because, of course, the crust is melting when you pump that much magma into it. Of course, it melts. But there's a lot of basically it's dominated by I and mostly A type granites. So Anthony Bud did a lot of work on that in his PhD thesis. Um, if we look at the geophysics again, the Olympic Dam is here in the centre, Adelaide is down here. There's an enormous gravity anomaly sitting underneath the Gawler Range volcanics. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that's a big, big, a, a large amount of matrix rock somewhere in the crust. Uh, it's probably in the mid to lower crust, um, but there's a lot of material there. And that is, so again, there's a huge magmatic province which is stewing up. It's, it's, it's searing and boiling off. If we could take a piece of the lower crust now, it would be full of quartz, azumarite, and saffron. <laughs> it would be hot as down there. And it has boiled off everything and it's formed this large igneous province in the upper crust. Um, that is the transient road mobilization event. And we know there was deformation at the same time because we have deformed granites of this broadly the same age, where you find on the left of the deformed granite and on the right, you see the red um, um, dike cutting it. That dike is 1580, the deformed granite is 1585. So we can say there was absolutely um, like ductile deformation happening in this, since this is on the York Peninsula. but also up in the north, we have this um, high temperature metamorphism deformation in Northern Gawler. It's the same time as the Olearian orogeny in the, in the Kernamona and, and, I, and I think lots of deformation event happening in Mount Isa at the same time as well. But so we've got a massive large igneous province, we've got high temperature metamorphism and we have deformation. That's the transient remobilization event. And if you put that all together, you kind of have this sort of geodynamic setting. Now, basically the central part of that diagram this is a cross section through the crust of mantle, okay? So it's thin spheres, purple, lithospheric mantle, and then up into the crust. But everything on the, on the left and right of that is imaginary. And all we really know is what's in the middle there. We, we think there, was a, there is a hydrous subduction-related metasomatized lithospheric mantle. 
There is probably that matrix underplate, that's that gravity feature. Uh, we have bimodal volcanics and we have a crustal domain boundary, that's for sure. And related to that, and potentially in the hanging wall of that, sits the IC deposits, you should say deposits, because there's more alignment. Okay. So that's the board, that's the pattern we're looking for. How to form one. How to find one. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> This is where I usually like to stop talking. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm talking to the, you know, if you're talking to mineral explorers, this is now when you stop talking. And when you're talking to the, um, you know, geologic survey people, then it's fine to talk like this, but never tell a mineral explorer how to find one because that's what their job is. So that they should find. Anyway, I'm going to give you three things <laughs> I think that we need to look for if we want to find one. I've sort of shown you at the bigger scale how to kind of zone in on an area, then what, what do you do next? Okay, so I'm going to talk about alteration mineralogy, geophysics, and then mineral composition and broadly some sort of sort of vectoring, quote unquote vectoring. Really important slide. And I actually, if any, if nothing else, this is what I want you to take away from today is this next two. Okay, so in the same way we can think of metamorphic facies like granulite, amphibolite, green schist, there are alteration facies as well. So there are repeatable um, compositional uh, assemblages or mineralogical assemblages which are related to alteration. Louise Corovo from the Geological Survey of Canada has published a lot on this stuff. I really recommend you having a look at her stuff. Um, it's really good work. She mapped a lot in the Great Bear Province in the Northwest Territories. And I know that in Northern Territory, you have a lot more outcrop than in South Australia. <laughs> But you don't have the glacially smooth pavements that they do yeah. in the Northwest Territories. Yeah. Am I right? <laughs> okay, so they've actually been able to not have, so initially when the mapping was done in these regions, people went across and said stratigraphy unit A, unit B, unit C, granite, right? And then of course the mappers all went home and had a party. But then Louise came along and said, hang on, you've missed the entirety of the alteration system which are overprinting this. So she was trying to connect the ore deposits to the stratigraphy and quite quickly realized that the, those ore deposits are linked to alteration systems, which are systematic in some way. And that's how this sort of stuff came out. So this actually comes from mapping. These are mapped sort of assemblages that Louise has worked on. So of course, there's gonna be some local variations and sometimes it won't perfectly fit, but in broadly from high temperature to low temperature, deep to shallow, this is the sort of facies you're looking at. So you have these albertites, sodium calcic alteration, calcic iron plus and minus magnesium scans, potassium iron dominated by magnetite biotite. Then there's the magnetite hematite transition. Then it's sort of hematite case bar. Then you get all your hydrous minerals, muscovite, chlorite, um, even a bit of carbonate before you finally end up with silica and quartz veins in some sort of specification. So there's this sort of sort of spatial and, and sort of um, thermal trend to these alteration assemblages. So um, importantly, oh, whoops, they actually, so, so that's important. So you can potentially map these things and say we're in the albertite zone, that's good. But on top of that, Louise is able to show that, okay, fine, we're looking for a hematite group, iron oxide, copper, gold, like the Olympic Dam, um, which is a, the second from the top on the, on the right-hand side. But we know that if we're in the albertites, we could well be expected to find some type of iron oxide appetite deposit, like a magnetite rich thing, okay, which is a karuna type. So it's, so it's really important to think about it in terms of what are the rocks that I have in this area and what deposits could be present given the alteration systematics you see. So it made from magnetite appetite, uh, magnetite isogy, concari type or carajas in Brazil, um, voices, uh, <clears throat> more scarn type systems, polymetallic scarns, or if you're actually in the hematite rich zones where you might well find something that looks like them. Damn. Um, epithermal style fractures and veining um, as like the last gasp of these things when everything else is dropped out except the quartz. Uh, but they can also carry gold as well. So it does depend on the timing and all the you know, permutations of the, of, of the system. So yeah, these are probably, just take a screenshot of that because that's, then you can, now you can go to sleep the rest of it. Okay, I just want to show you a few pictures. <laughs> Pippi, what do they look like in the, you know, in drill core, these are your albertites. Um, you know, listen, I would never have picked that as albite. I just would have said it's a silicified K feldspar, hematite, altered K feldspar, but it turns out it's albite when you do your staining. Um, so L Louise was, she um, told me off a lot when she was in Australia when I visited in Canada because uh, we didn't do staining as 
she basically, yeah, we don't disdain you, right? But in, she did disdain. She's just saying you can get people to do it for you. Or yeah. these days we just go the X, uh, XRF or the whatever, exactly. okay? But the point is look out for it because it might be there. You might just sort of presume it's case bar, but it might be appetite, which is an important indicator of the temperature and kind of facets of the alteration system. Uh, and there's some absolutely spectacular ones. Anybody comes down and visits me in Adelaide one day, we can take a drive out to Wallaroo and the York Peninsula because there's a spectacular quarry which goes through this purely metasomatic rock, absolutely full of Cape Field Spar. Um, there's hematite overprints, but it's Cape Field Spar, uh, pyroxene, the green pyroxenes, and um, there are some anthropoles in that as well. But it's just, you know, you can see it's forming as relation to folds as well. So there's deformation, and this is almost like it's, we have no idea what the protolith is. It's completely replaced by metasomatic um, alteration. I took Louise Corrigo there. I was expecting her to be a little bit impressed, but she was not impressed. <laughs> it's just, she's seen the great bear. You know what I mean? Like she was like, oh yeah, it's okay, but where's your magnetite? You know, there's magnetite in this, so it's magnetite. But yeah, but it's good, but you know, anyway, that's actually South Australian, um, the South Australian rock in a national. Rock garden oh, is cool. the Alana, Alana Medicine. It's a specky rock run. Related to that iron oxide copper gold yeah, system, nice. so there's a good story behind it. The scans, you see them also in the Eastern Gold Crate on um, garnet, um, uh, amphibole magnetite, um, uh, pyroxene scans. So the garnets are, are, are the calcium garnets. So what's that? Grossula? Think grossula? Anyway, don't. Anyway, it's, can, it's, it's calcium. calcium it's scan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cross Russia. Yeah, Russia. Yeah, Thanks. <laughs> anyway, we dated them. So we we dated them. We were thinking, oh, this is not him, him, the Olympic domain related. It's just older or whatever. It turns out that is related. It's definitely the same fluid system. It's just deeper. So it's amphibole magnetite. There's pyroxene scar. There's apatite and thionine things like that. So this is also related to that earlier high temperature fluid pulse that goes through these rocks. Um, you can find this is a K-field spar, or sorry, this is a potassium iron alteration. In this case, the potassium is manifest as phlogopite. The magnetite, I mean, it's trust me, it's magnetite. I just like the picture of the phlogopite better than I would want to do reflected light. But it's magnetite, phlogopite, so this is K-field spar, uh, a, a, a biotite or phlogopite as opposed to K-field spar. But then you do find that in places <coughs> you get this overprint, right? So this is where the hematite is starting to come in. This is transition from magnetite to uh, hematite and um, this is the classic sort of texture you see in these deposits where the magnetite is a little remnant cores and it's now almost completely pervaded, completely replaced by hematite and that's where the chapel pyrite and, and other uh, copper minerals often come in <clears throat> of course this particular example is not heavily mineralized and, and 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 that's probably because there hasn't been flushed enough by the secondary fluids or at least the, the, the kind of fluid system hasn't evolved enough to, to oxidize it completely because the, it's, the, it's this sort of pulsing of fluids through the rock and oxidation of that fluid, which is really important for um, uh, um, precipitating out the copper sulfides as well. So if you had the Olympic Dam version of that, it would be almost no magnetite at all. But at depth at Olympic Dam, so they drilled 2,300 meters below the deposit from surface, just straight down. I think they drilled it at an angle, you know, to see what's what is the Olympic Dam deeps, and guess what? It's full of magnetite. Okay, so no one's surprised, and least of all Louise Corrivo, she could have told you what was down there. You don't need to spend how many millions of dollars to drill 2.3 kilometers under the Olympic Dam because guess what? You get magnetite, you get fluid apatite, and quartz charcoal process. So you get these deep early high temperature mineral assemblages um, in uh, in the deep, um, uh, the Olympic Dam deeps, okay? Then you get to the Olympic Dam shallows uh, and you get the hematite breaches. So up on the top left, the, the hematite breaches are really quite spectacular and they're polymixed. So you see multiple order, multiple breccia types, but you also see breaches, uh, what do you call? Um, yeah, it's rebrecciated. So you get you get a you get a hematite breccia as a class within hematite breccia. So this system has been pulsing and pumping and pulsing and pumping. And it's definitely like to say, create a magmatic, very shallow meteoric waters involved uh, associated with the volcanics and so on. Uh, Prominent Hill is relatively similar. It's more structurally controlled, I would say, uh, and Caratina likewise is another hematite breccia. So these things are the 
these are the lower temperature upper crust um, kind of signature of that broader system. Um, then you get these quartz phases, just show an example here, um, limited or range volcanics uh, as the final kind of thing. Okay, so you looked at alteration, then we know where we are in the alteration system, but what we obviously need to use is geophysical targeting because it's undercover. Um, the top one just shows you the on the left is the TMI, delta magnetic intensity. On the right is the Bouget gravity anomaly, and it's Olympic Dam. So you can see that it's got a lot of magnetite somewhere, <laughs> and it's got a lot of hematite. Okay, so it's big. And then one day they drilled it, and of course they found a big deposit. But the other deposit, so I'll show you Caravatina down the other one. That's got much more of a structural, it looks more structurally controlled. It almost looks a bit like an asymmetric porphyroclast in there, kind of north northwest trend of that um, with a little bit of a jog in it. So, which, you know, we know these things were active. And so it's no surprise if you have a little jog that you form and focus fluids into these systems. Um, again, there's a little bit more of an offset between the gravity and magnetics. Um, and so that's going to tell you something about the relative positioning of the hematite versus magnetite phase in that, in that, in that I guess, in that local, um, in, the, in the alteration system related to that ore deposit. Um, and the top one is different. That's Oak Dam. Oh, the bottom one is still Cape Dam, but the top one is Oak Dam, which is a recently discovered deposit. Um, well, only in the last couple of years, BHP announced they discovered that one. Um, it's Oak Dam West. <coughs> and that is almost entirely a gravity anomaly and very low magnetic anomaly in that region. Now, that might be because of magnetic remnants. I'm not sure, but it's certainly got a lot of hematite in it as well. So you want to be drilling either the hematite or the magnetite anomalies. And this is the kind of the best case scenario is you drill slightly offset anomalies. So where there's a little bit of hematite, a little bit of magnetite, and they're slightly offset, that's where you should drill. So that's why there's this schematic map here uh, from that classic paper as well. So yeah, that's how to find one. Um, you can look at the geochemistry as well. Um, this is a this is like a like a 3D view. Again, this is. Uh, we're looking on South Australia here. This is the coastline here, right? So we've just tilted South Australia. There's the peninsulas, Adelaide, which is off the map here. These are all drill holes which have for which we have multi-element hole rock geochemistry uh, publicly available from. Uh, in terms of cerium, only locally does it show up. So prominent hill cabaretina show up. Uh, when this was done, sorry, the Olympic Dam wasn't included in it. If you plotted the Olympic Dam, it, it would show up, I'm pretty sure, in cerium. Uh, but it also shows up in antimony. Uh, the antimony has a wider footprint. So if you're going along and you're drilling a series of holes, no one would do that. But if you did, you would go from low antimony towards high antimony. You'd think, okay, that's a good sign. We're getting closer. And then if you find cerium, I got to better. If you find tin, tungsten, and molybdenum, that's even better. So Kathy Eric, who's the um, the main geometallurgist at Olympic Dam always talks about tin, moly, tungsten. There are three things she always talks about that. So they're the key element, indicator elements for ICG systems um, at Olympic Dam. So there is a footprint, right? As And the rear is also part of that as well, I should say. There's also a mineralogical footprint as well. So this is a hyperspectral mineralogy, it's a hologger. Basically, they took a series of drill holes across the deposit and hologged the whole, the whole lot of them. Um, so the top panel on the right shows you the white mica and the um, chlorite composition. Uh, the chlorite shows you um, increase in magnesium um, as you get into the center. Mm. Uh, the white mica actually increases in iron as you get to the center. So there is different subtle variations in the composition of those chlorite and white mica that will tell you you're getting, you potentially getting closer to a deposit. So if you're getting in one area, a, a, um, a low iron white mica that's distal, a high iron white mica is more proximal and so on. Um, and you can also see that in the field spars, um, the more albite you have, the worse it is, you should get rid of field spar altogether. But basically it starts albite, K field spar deposit. So there's a zonation in the, in the mineralogy as well. And that's at the scale of the deposit, that's like, for oh, that's probably 10 kilometer traverse there. So that's a quite a significant anomaly um, in those, in terms of the chemistry of those minerals. Yeah. So it should, you know, in theory should be able to pick that up, right? 
All right, so mineralogy relates to the deposit types. I mentioned those different styles, right? And alteration facies. Geophysics, you can tell something about the gravity and magnetics. Of course, if you have electrical methods, you would use them. I think in Eastern Gaul Craton, because it's under basically 400 meters of cover, or at the minimum 300 meters, uh, and sometimes 800 meters, um, the electrical geophysics is not able to see through that, that deep. Mm. Certainly not the airborne stuff. Maybe some of the magnetic can see it as well. But obviously, you can use that if, it, if they're pyrotite and other conductive minerals in there as well, sulfides and so on. The geochemistry, tin, uh, cerium, I talked about, uh, tin, uh, tungsten, moly. Thank you, antimony. Well, I didn't mention light rare earths, but they're also enriched in these deposits as well. Okay, okay that was, that's how to find them. And then I just want to finish with a little discussion on the uranium, because I didn't mention that at all, but having just been out to um, <coughs> Kakadu and looking at um, the Kambolgi sandstone, um, you know, I just think that's fascinating mineral systems out there as well. And here, the, the Olympic Dam, it's just what I just wanted to kind of bring to your attention that Olympic Dam uranium is multi-stage. Like no one's surprised, okay? <laughs> but it's interesting that the work they have done, uh, they've got very nice piece of work because they've got very you know, compositional zones like that slide B there, you can see the uhedral versus non uhedral ranurite and so on. So they've dated both of these, they have different compositional uh, values and so on, but the uhedral Uranonite turns out to be 1588 on the right, oh, sorry, on the left-hand side, so 1588, which is, that's, I mean, basically exactly the age of the hematite, it's exactly the age of the copper and, and the, the main sulfide mineralization in there. Uh, but it turns out that you get, look, you get a 530 and you get a 470. So 470 is what we have for local called the Delamere neurogeny. 530 is right at the end as a depositional, you know, what do you call that, PM or something, right? So it's, it's, it, no one's surprised that, that the, the thing is acting like an open system and it's recrystallizing that time. And you can even think about that in terms of, you know, a bunch of near protozoic sediments sitting on top of a highly uraniferous um, enriched, um, iron-rich basement, uh, you know, and these sediments have got material, fluid circulating through them they, they can carry a lot of uranium and they precipitate out when it hits these iron or sulfur rich rocks, which is basically, you know, that's just a redox formation. And so, yeah, you're getting secondary um, ultra, um, uraninite and uranium minerals forming the Olympic uh, Dam um, related to massive regional scale tectonic processes. Thanks. I hope that was.